It's Tuesday, September 24th, 2024. Let us gather together and experience the goodness of God. I'm Pastor Trey Comstock. We'll begin with our scripture of the week, Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37, and a piece by me entitled, That Time I Accidentally Food Poisoned My Chemical Romance. Then, Pastor Emily Larson, Pastor Scott Catchett, and I will talk scripture, and more specifically, about how God's innate goodness stems from God's lack of taking advantage of God's absolute position of power. But first, a reading from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying, The Son of Man is to be betrayed in human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. When they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. He then took a little child and put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. It was the spring of 2007, and the concert booking folks at the College of William & Mary chose to host their largest concert ever, My Chemical Romance. For those of you not versed in late 2000s emo, punk, rock acts, at that particular point in time, My Chemical Romance and their Black Parade tour ruled the roost. They owed a lot to Green Day, Taking Back Sunday, and Fall Out Boy, who all paved the way for a massive mainstream act dressed like a one-bit color version of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band, complete with stark white pancake makeup and dark black eyeliner and eyeshadow. At that specific moment, they enjoyed a huge level of fame. And we had never hosted anything of their magnitude. I worked as town crew for a lot of the concerts that passed through the college. Over time, I got used to how they normally functioned. Each band submitted a specific set of demands that we, as the venue side, had to meet. This usually included what kind of hotel, what kind of flights, what kind of food, what kind of dressing room slash green room area. For an outdoor gig with famous reggae act, they demanded their own pavilion tent with solid sides so folks could not see in and witness their pregame routine. Particularly sweaty hip-hop act, gave specific requirements for brand and amount of towels on hand because periodically wiping away sweat formed a key part of their onstage routine. As broke college kids, we would raid the dressing rooms after the concert and take the leftover food home with us. I consider this one of the key perks in working these shows. So much of what they demanded ended up not getting used. So I got a bounty of food, dessert, and hyper-specific hand towels. Most of the acts treated us pretty well, or largely ignored us, and allowed us to do our work while they did theirs. The very famous My Chemical Romance went a little differently. Dealing with their escalating demands sent my boss to a level of stress that I hadn't witnessed in him before. They needed this, they needed that. Her female co-workers kept getting sidetracked because the band wanted to hang out with them. Key to my role in all of this, My Chemical Romance rejected the food that we had provided, so we ordered them alternative food from the only local dive bar with a menu fit for human consumption. Outside of pancake houses, late 2000s Williamsburg, Virginia didn't have a lot of options. I volunteered to hop in a college-owned van to go pick up dinner round two for our very demanding emo headliners. I nearly wrecked the van, trying to park it in a hurry at a restaurant with famously bad parking. Finally receiving my bounty, I rushed back to feed the band. Our second offering proved acceptable. My chemical romance eventually performed, and I had a great time working with their road crew to pack up the half-dozen 18-wheelers worth of equipment and send my chemical romance on their not-so-merry way. The next day, We got an email from our boss that My Chemical Romance 
canceled their gig the next night in Detroit because they came down with food poisoning. The most likely suspect was the food that I nearly ruined a college vehicle to obtain, the food that they had demanded after they found the original food unworthy. And people say we get no justice in this life. As I write this, Sean Combs, who had many stage names over the years, sits in a New York jail, indicted on enough abuse, sexual abuse and racketeering charges to curdle the blood. So my own encounter with toxic celebrity appears quaint and comically mild. In the time of Christ and the early church, several Roman emperors gained such a reputation for self-indulgence, self-aggrandizement, violence, and a desire for worship as a deity that their reputations loom large even to this day. Nero, Commodus, and Caligula. Power sits at the core of all of it. Non-famous people can't send college students dashing out into the night because dinner round one didn't please. Only when one reaches the level of Roman emperor can one get away with declaring oneself a god and get millions of people to go along with it. Humans will amaze you with what they will come up with if they know they can get away with it. This brings into starker relief the life and ministry of Jesus. He has the greatest claim to absolute power of any human being to walk the earth. In John 1, the evangelist presents Jesus as the word of God, forging the underlying structure and logic of creation. In Trinitarian theology, we view Jesus as a co-equal member of the Trinity with God the Creator and the Holy Spirit. The Gospel writers tell us of his miraculous deeds of healing, casting out demons, food multiplication, and the overcoming of death. He's a pretty good argument for some special treatment. I am literally God, and I'm here to save you all. The least you could do is wash my feet, carry me as we travel, and bring me some better grub. Obviously, he didn't do that. He came to serve, and not for others to serve him. He spent tons of personal time with people in the lowest rungs of his society. Lepers, tax collectors, unclean women, people with disabilities, foreigners, sinners, and children. No one has ever had more power, and he never used it for his own personal benefit, even as they torturously murdered him. Celebrities can be fun. They mostly don't contain the makings of monsters. Who doesn't love following Taylor Swift's boyfriend and his merry band of football men? Many use their power and platform for good, raising awareness about important issues, donating huge sums to charities, creating community-oriented businesses, buying failing soccer teams, or making a darn fine tequila. Still, none of them will ever achieve the character and goodness of God. All of humanity's history and the arc of scripture should remind us that God chose to orient the most powerful force in the universe towards the sacrificial love of God's creation. No one could top that. Instead of doing what the most powerful beings of our species keep doing, God doesn't serve God's own wants and desires to the detriment of others. God does the exact opposite. So as you just heard in the piece, I had a bad time. My chemical romance had a bad time. <laughs> my female co-workers had a bad time. Like everybody, everybody involved had a bad old time <laughs> at that concert. And I'm reading this as the P. Diddy, Sean Puffy Combs stuff is coming to light. And I'm like, just at, this was a great, or t like this was a great week to be talking about what makes someone truly great is emulating Christ because like I don't I don't know about y'all's news world but the particular weird end of millennial Twitter that I live on was just like rocked to their core by uh, so it turns out that all the like the stuff that we kind of thought was an act from P Diddy was not an act he was just horrific. And this is swirling together with the time I food poisoned my chemical romance in what was absolutely my worst ever gig as town crew or roadie or anything. And it was just a great reminder that Jesus, who is far better than any of these people, 
who is literally God among us, did none of, did nothing even approaching that. He washed feet. He did not demand better food or for people to cover up his crimes. Well, and it was such a, a good reminder of, you know, the people who come first are the people who would never put themselves right. first. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like the people who actually deserve to be put first, a.k.a. Jesus, Savior of the universe, right? God of all. Um didn't put himself first, put himself last, put himself in the position of servant, put himself in a position to die, literally, um, and then told us to go and do the same. Right, and and again, I, I keep making this point because it's easy for us to lose sight of it, of like how great Jesus really is. And I do, like, not like, <laughs> like, not like he's a great guy, but like, He's the most powerful being to walk the earth. Mm-hmm. Like we, you get, and in some ways this is good because like you're supposed to have like a relationship with Jesus. And we talked a lot um, in the past couple of weeks about his humanity. And that's really important too. But do not lose sight of what's going on here. What you're really dealing with here is Jesus Christ, God among us, walking the earth, all the, you know, Uh, incredible godly power, itty bitty living space, that whole deal. And this, we think of this, like all of this like toxic celebrity stuff goes back to, well, they can get away with it because they're really famous, right? Like when I, when I do gigs, I can't look at the people who have like invited me to speak and go, no, yeah, I'm sorry. That food is insufficient. I demand better food. Like, (laughs) the people who hire me to speak would laugh at me because, like, who the heck am I? But, like, My Chemical Romance can get away with that because they're My Chemical Romance. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, it's like the the whole M&M thing. I I want all brown M&Ms. Yeah. And and, and though they sometimes have purposes for that to see if they pay attention to details, but the reality of it is so much of it is, like, I'm just doing it because I can't. Yeah, having been on the, having spent a lot of my life on the other side of those like negotiations about writer, they're called writers, like negotiations yeah. about writers. It's like y'all, we're gonna do our best to do it. Like, do not, and, and again, ninety nine percent of the people I worked with over the years were at worst just like coolly professional, of like as I said, the piece like didn't care about us, and just did their job. And like that was fun. Like I don't. I am not trying to make friends with these people. Some of them were like really chill, but a lot of them were just like there to do a job. You are just a tool to do the job, and I don't mind that. I am literally a tool for them to do their job. I am part of a team to make this gig happen. I don't mind. I don't even mind if they want a specific kind of towel or a specific kind of chicken or whatever. Like who cares? Um, I, I, as someone who has to travel a lot, and has to get real I have to get really specific about like what I pack for myself. I, I get it. I get it. I get it. But like this was this next level of we're just gonna mistreat you because we can, yeah. because we can get away with it. And this just gives that really stark contrast to what Jesus is talking about here in Mark 9. It makes me think of the celebrities that you hear about who are doing good works, but in secret. Yeah. So like like Keanu Reeves, yeah. right, would be the one that, you know, has done, given away millions of dollars, um, you know, like bought all of the stuntmen on the Matrix series of motorcycle just for fun, right? Or like adopts <laughs> the animals the, from the movies or whatever. There's shots of him carrying props and camera equipment up the hill of Mamatra right. during the filming of John Wick 3. Right. Normally, yeah. he's, he's one of the biggest movie stars on the planet. Those guys don't carry gear. Right. Except. But he, he did. But he did. Right. He is carrying right. gear up the hill just he because he rides the subway. Right. Like, just he, very. He doesn't touch people. Down to earth. Yes. Right. That was one of like my favorite things. When he's taking things. a photo with you, like, he doesn't touch you mm-hmm. just to, like, deliberately honor your boundaries. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, but it makes me think of, like, and these are not things he does to get more media right no he, right like he doesn't bring it up he's just actually that guy yeah right like that makes me want to meet Keanu Reeves because he's just really that dude um so like the people who actually get it the people who actually got what Jesus was saying here about like put yourself last not first are the ones who would never admit right that they're doing that thing 
Well, right. th- and this is yeah. where this is the direction the sermon took was that like fundamentally this is a story or this is really a section of Mark that is just about yo be good yes. actually be good that in the end what makes Christ Christ is that he is genuinely good. Mm-hmm. He is, and we are called upon to emulate him, but not even emulate him tactically, right? Like, this is not like, okay, let me run down the checklist of things like Jesus did, and I will do all of those things, and then I will be good. Because this is still about, more about an intrinsic motivation than an extrinsic, like, list of actions. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. it is actually a state of being. Be, in the words of E.T., be good. <laughs> Actually be good. Mm-hmm. Whether as an individual or as a church or as an institution. Like, because how you become the greatest, which in this case is in, actually in all cases, it's Jesus. Then it is because he is just intrinsically motivated by love of humanity. Uh, that And God's love for humanity is an embodiment of God's love for humanity. And he is there to actually do the thing, and it's really hard for him. As we talked about last week, like it's really hard for him, and yet he does it anyways because he works through it because of how much he loves humanity. And, and I was sitting here thinking as you're talking about, you know, so often we, we talk about, yeah, we we need to not harm other people and stuff like that. And I was thinking about those, uh, you know, those those rules, you know, uh, do yeah. good, do no harm, and right, yes. And of course, tended to the ordinances of God, but but it's those are different. You, you cannot be harming people and still not doing good. Uh, right. it, it, it's both. And then we're sitting here talking about Jesus. If anybody could have exercised any bit of yes, I am the man, it was most definitely him. Right. You know, uh, uh-huh. I, I think of you know uh, uh-huh. my kids are big into uh, you know anime, and you see how they react to My Hero Academia to uh, All Might. Or, you know, uh, those reacting to Goku when he's in his ultimate forms and all that. Right, yeah, yeah, Jesus right. is so beyond all of that uh, <laughs> that anyone right. we should fanboy over, it is most definitely the creator of the universe who then says, yeah, I'm going to wash your feet. Yeah, right. the, the, uh, I'm going to suffer. And why, why are you arguing yeah. over who's going to be the best with me? You're not getting it. We're going to be the least. We, we, we are right. here for the ex- at the expense of everyone else. And it's like, it's again, that's why this is a holy mystery. That that doesn't compute in my way of thinking. You know, uh, if we're winners, if we're head, then we're somehow doing things better than someone else. And God says, nope, that's not really how it goes. Well, but it, or at least we equate, like, that position has privilege. Like, yeah. one of the things that is just true about human the structure of human society going back for as long as there's been society is that position and position go with privilege that and and we don't even we don't even think about it right we we marvel that uh keanu reeves carries bits i marvel that carries yes um now when you grow up in the theater before you're famous we all do that yeah we all do that right every actor you know, t- helps build the set, helps strike the set. In every community theater, in high school theater, in college theater, when you're mm-hmm. coming up, when you're helping your friends make their first movies, everybody's doing everything. Yeah, joined Right, effort. like, even if you're, like, even if you're, like, the, you know, I, when I was at the height of my theatrical career um, in high school, when I, I was Malvolio in Twelfth Night, right? So I'm this, like, you know, I'm, I'm the lead actor in that show. I built a ton of that set. Right, I put in shop hours. Right, I, I come from a, a theater department where everyone to graduate had to do some shop hours. I spent a lot more time in the shop than most people, but like everyone did shop hours. Everyone was there for strike. You didn't get the pa- cast party until the set was struck, mm-hmm. and so that's how we all grew up. No doubt, how Keanu Reeves grew up too. But when you get to that level of privileged position, where you're the you know the thirty million dollar movie, <laughs> whatever, right, then Everyone on that set exists for you. And it's why a lot of abuses can happen, yeah. right? Because it's this total, like, awful power structure. Right. But all Keanu, like, I, shout out to Keanu Reeves. Like, I, I'm, not, yeah. I'm not actually trying to downplay him. I'm actually saying, like, 
he is much more in the spirit of that art form. This is an art form I fundamentally understand. It is a collaborative art form where everyone should be working together to make sure the show happens. Yeah. And Keanu is actually living that out. Yes. And, and that's what Jesus is saying for us is that right. we shouldn't be shocked by people who act like yeah. Keanu. And I don't know his spirituality, but he's in a oh, lot of goodness. ways exhibiting what Christians should be doing. And what Jesus or he's is really saying. Living a val- he's living a value structure. Yeah, he's yeah. He's living well a self-giving value structure. Definitely, mm-hmm. as far as that goes. And, and the reality of what this is is like, wow, Jesus did that? No, Jesus is saying we all should be doing that yes he did that but he did that as an example going this is what you need to be doing and it's oh (laughs) because that's not our natural Uh. tendency i mean you think oh well people it is just not our natural tendency you have entire countries that have caste systems entire you know Mm -hmm. that's built upon uh, this particular group is not as important as this group and it it was even a part of our country and in some ways still is whether it's on lines of money or on lines of the way you dress on lines of the way you see it everywhere from you know just be a teacher to high school or junior high and, and you see that there are levels of hierarchy built over the silliest of things you know and uh, yeah. it, it's not the way it's supposed to be. And that's what this is saying, is that we are to realize that to put someone else as more important than you, to think of their needs over yours, is really what the meaning of love is. Right. And, and, and as with like overcoming temptation, so too with understanding their 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 role in the universe yeah god models this first mm-hmm. this is another place and again i think this is you know across this kind of chapter seven eight at nine of mark where we are in mark right now mm-hmm. this is a lot of what mark is driving home showing the ways that jesus overcomes temptation yeah. to love us that jesus unlike like the temple hierarchy right so you would have seen like in the mind's eye of some of mark's readers would be the you know chief priest in their finery you know eating the meat that has been handed over as the worship of god like having all of their every needs provided for because they're the god men Right. Like they're the men who are, you know, God's representatives. And then when God's literal representative and that like literally God shows up, Jesus does none of that. (laughs) None of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely none of it. Right. Like Jesus gets baptized. Jesus grows up. Jesus gets circumcised. Like Jesus does literally nothing i mean even as he is dying he could you know command an army of angels or even just like tell the thieves to shut up and go away and he doesn't even do that right like as he's you know one of my favorite deeds i think this is in john's gospel it sounds like a detail from john's gospel we're like he's like yo take care of my mom right like right as he's dying on the cross yeah. If he's if he's if he's a, if he could be given a moment of selfishness, when one is dying torturously at the hands of the Roman Empire, and uh, you know, you would forgive him for being a little snippy on the cross, right? <laughs> no, he like forgives the the thieves, mm-hmm. um, and then like tells John to look after his mother. Yep. <laughs> like like yeah, it's just yeah. it's just an utterly like to a normal human way of thinking utterly baffling and yet that is what again that's the mystery that's the mystery that pulls you in of like why like why is it like this Mm -hmm. oh this is setting up how we are all to live like jesus is going to live this way and so then you too live this way and then the world gets a lot better because it's a lot less like who has the key to the special club bathroom, whatever, and a lot more. I mean, we should, we like just build hierarchy as you brought up, Scott, like we build hierarchies out of the dumbest stuff. Yes, we do. The absolute dumbest stuff. And, you know, I, I think, you know, this is what's ruined air travel, right? Because everyone has to have their special status. Yeah. That's that it takes 35 minutes to board an airplane. Be, and, and 
So they've done, I think I've talked about this before, uh, Mythbusters did an analysis. And this has not just been done by Mythbusters, but I, I love the Mythbusters. They yes. built like a, a fake airplane and tested different ways of boarding. The fastest way to board an airplane involves no status. It's mm -hmm. just outside in. That all the window seats board, then all the middle seats board, then all the aisle seats board. It's the outside in. And then everyone, that is the fastest way to board an airplane. The yep. second fastest way to board an airplane is the Southwest method, which by the way, they're going to be getting rid of. I know. I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where it's just chaos. It's just mildly ordered chaos. Yeah. That is faster. The slowest way to board an airplane is via, sta via statuses. Mm -hmm. And so it is actually like a worse way to get on an airplane. Everyone is stuck at that stinking airport longer. And they are, at this point, close to hell on earth. <laughs> hell on earth. I hate, like, most <laughs> of the airports I have to interact with, I absolutely abhor. Um, and we are just spending more time in these hell places because humans really get off on status. We really do like creating hierarchies. I will say... Um, so it's not true everywhere. Clicks are everywhere, but you mentioned high school and junior high, Scott. And the other day I was at a high school football game. It was a homecoming game. Um, and my husband looked at me and he was like, they're all dressing the same. I can't tell who the clicks are. Right. Right. Like I can't tell who the mean girls are. I can't tell who the punk kids are. I'm like, yeah, that's, I think that's kind of intentional now. Yeah. Right. That there's less of that. Like, oh, as a, it still exists. Oh, like, as a kid who grew up yeah, with they, school uniforms the whole way, <laughs> trust me, we found a way. Yes, you they find, find a way different for ways. Life, life, fi life finds a way. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Well, because, because then it becomes about <laughs> shoes. Yep. Or then yes. it becomes about watches. Or then it becomes about the Cars, amount of your underwear you're showing. Or whatever. Um, or whatever, right? That we, <laughs> yeah. These are all things that specifically happened at the John Cooper School circa 2001 to 2005. <laughs> but, you know, we, we found ways. Or, like, I, I found, you know, every way to almost break the dress code, but like, to break the spirit of the dress code without breaking yeah. the letter of the dress code. So you weren't allowed beards, Okay, so I grew my mutton chops down to below my ears. Of course you did. But you had to wear <laughs> tennis shoes, but it said nothing about drawing all over your Chuck Taylors. And so Chuck Taylors are tennis shoes to the technical letter of the law. And so I wore like the most marked up Chuck Taylors imaginable. You, I'm, all I'm saying is we found a way. Yeah. You and I had very different upbringings. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh. you know, I, as I talked about on last week's show, was also, you know, I, I am an autonomy freak. I'm not a control freak. I'm an mm -hmm. autonomy freak. And life within a private school circuit 2001 to 2005 was not in line with my lifelong commitment to autonomy. And so I found ways to maintain my autonomy uh, without <laughs> doing what my brother did, which was just uh, like – just go to the office all the time for dress code violations. All right. Yeah, yeah. That was Drew's solution was I'm just going to wear this slipknot hoodie. This is in no way. This is in no way dress code. I'm just going to wear it anyways. What are they going to do about it? Which <laughs> fair question. Drew, this is this is you know I, I don't talk about my brother a ton on this show, but like this is one of Drew's just fundamental positions in life. And certainly at that time, my brother looks like me, but is like six inches taller and has this like really deep voice, and it's like. What, what are they? What are they going to do about it? And I'm like, it turns Send out to Drew, not much, because what are they going to do? Actually, expel you for a Slipknot hoodie? Like that's the dumbest reason ever. Um, but yeah, uh, we we find ways to do it, and like some of it is just like, you know, we're joking, but like some of this is just expressing your individuality. But right. some of yeah. it is really that like that deeply pernicious human instinct to status and privilege mm -hmm. that we. You know, we you know Scott, you brought up like we we bring up, we invent entire systems of government. Yeah, right. Yes. We create like lords and ladies. We, you know, we uh, you know fawn over Elon Musk or whatever, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, or whoever. Or celebrities are in this position to do. You know, the Me Too movement was like a so many stories of like that only can happen. 
because of like what happened around Diddy, just yeah. to an even further degree. That dude should go to prison based allegedly, 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 based on what's been stated in right. the indictment. If that's true, that dude should go to prison. Yeah. Allegedly, 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 this is a podcast, and so we can't just say he should go to prison. He should if those crimes are allegedly true, he should go right. to prison. Right. Um but like all of that is those are extreme versions, and there's, le- you know, what My Chemical Romance did to us was a, a much less extreme version, but it's all the same, like, real dark thing that drive. by the way, drives a lot of our economy, yeah. drives a lot of, you know, people really want to pay for status items. This yeah. is, a, a Ferrari will only sell cars to certain people. Yeah. Because they want to stay a status item and they're only going to sell to people that will like maintain that image as a status item. And like a Ferrari is cool. Um, there's a, a certain pastor in this city that allegedly, allegedly, allegedly really likes them and good uh-huh. for him. But like that's a real uh-huh. like weird. And that get, actually, to build on that for a second, this is my challenge with the prosperity gospel writ large. Yes. Because yeah. where in the teachings of Jesus did he look like a financial winner? Right. Like, it's a real... Like, or does he look like a winner at all? At all! I mean, by any status. Yeah. By, you know... You know who looks like a winner is the beast in Revelation. Not to be whatever. Not to be whatever about this for a second. But you want to know, like, I, I wrote about this and this everything. But you like, this came up in last week's show. But, like, you want to know who looked like a winner? It was the beast. Like, that's the whole, like, the whole pitch is like, oh, the beast really looks like a winner. So people are really going to hop on board with it. And, like, these Christian guys, they keep looking like they're losing. Like, oh, my God, what's up with them? Like, I, mm. But also. The, the biggest rope of dope in Jesus history. like that. Yeah, biggest rope of dope in history. Exactly. Exactly. And, but, it, like. One of the rest of Revelations that keeps happening. Because Revelations is in some ways about the end times, and in some ways just about Roman emperors. Because yeah. they kept doing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We love this stuff. And you're watching it infect even the disciples. Mm. You're in good company. I mean, yeah, this center arguing, oh, it's going to be such and such. And then you have the uh, other uh, rendition where it's yep. the mom who asks, can yes. I... Jesus. Uh, can my boy sit on your right and left side? I mean, mm-hmm. I'm sure they pretended to be, oh, Mom, don't do that. But what did he say? I'm <laughs> oh, yeah, what did he say? What did he say? What did he say? And in the end, Peter does essentially end up Christ's right hand guy, mm-hmm. but it only comes after like that instinct to willful power gets yeah. ground out of Peter. Mm-hmm. Like Peter doesn't really f- is not really and uh, you know this is where like seeing Peter at a low point and then able to come back from that I think is really important to understand his ability to be a Christian leader because yeah. he comes in you know as one of the people driving these conversations like I want to be the greatest I'm gonna be the greatest not you and maybe <laughs> out of that experience of you know. Uh, uh, denying Christ, getting called out for it. Ooh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, it, you know, Peter goes through a really rough period, and in the end, like, Jesus forgives him, and he grows, and he becomes, clearly becomes, the leader the early Christian movement needed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he, you're seeing him on this journey, and he doesn't start there. He starts in this place of, you know, we are, we're, we're midway through this story, and he is like, uh, yeah, I too wish to be the greatest among you because I am so great. Yeah. And, uh-huh. and you see such a change in his heart. I mean, because here's the one, oh, I'm going to fight for you. And, oh, wait, let me run off and hide. You see all that. But through the redemption, you know, when you look at what tradition says, uh, Peter was martyred. You know, he, he yep. doesn't come out of this looking like a uh, winner in the world's view. But then even when he's about to be crucified, you see a change in the humbleness. And he he requests to be upside down because he said he said he doesn't right. want to die in the same way that a savior. He, he's not worthy of that. And I'm like, um, not worthy of being beaten and humiliated. And th- that's um, that's kind of a crazy yeah. way of thinking there, Peter. Well, even if you just think about 
the life that Peter let go. Yeah. By the way, so here's my theory is the kid in this story is one of Peter's children. If we're in Capernaum, we're in Peter's house. Right. One of their main hubs for ministry in Capernaum is Peter's house, which, mm-hmm. by the way, we have potentially the archaeological remains of. Yeah. We know that Peter is a house. We know that Peter has a mother-in-law. Mm-hmm. This means Peter probably has children. Why is there just like a random kid in the room? My theory is it's one of Peter's. This is neither here nor there. I just um, could like, be. Like here's like you know, here's the here's this prop child that gets placed in the middle. <laughs> Whose prop child is this? Well, it's Peter's. But like you think about the life that Peter left behind, and so Peter was you know going to inherit his father's business and be a you know successful yeah. Capernaum you know Sea of Galilee fisherman with you know the kind of you know small town social prestige that comes with being the like owner of one of the important businesses you know mm-hmm. you can you know this is the like the honor given a car dealer a restaurant owner or that like there there's like a social standing there's a social security there's a you know a, a thing he worked for his whole life he would have grown up in the fishing trade we know you know already he and his brother are serving in the father's business because the father's most odds are aged out of it etc etc et yeah right? He lets go. He walks away from that whole life, follows Jesus, and then dies a martyr a thousand miles from home, right? He dies in Rome, on, theoretically, we believe, on the spot where St. Peter's Basilica is. There's enough archaeology down there that I buy it. Um, he's martyred in Rome a thousand miles from home. For away from that business. We don't know what happens to that family business, by the way. Uh, mm-hmm. Hopefully that kid grew up fast. I don't know, right? Don't know. Um, but like Peter, just like Paul, but like both of those guys, we see them leave behind really futures with social prestige. Mm-hmm. One as a leading Pharisee, one as an important business owner in Capernaum yeah. to go and live the life that Christ lived. Uh, which in that case was like travel all over the place for no pay and no security, you know, to be semi-homeless, and certainly in the case of Paul. But like Peter ends up real far from home too, mm-hmm. real far from home, and dies a martyr's death at the hands of the Roman Empire. Which is exactly what Christ is saying here. I yeah. mean, Christ hangs out with the children and puts yeah. them in a position of power. The prostitutes, the Syrophoenician woman, the tax collectors, mm-hmm. the, you know, all of these people that everyone else sees as last, as yep. lower, as less. Um, Jesus associates himself with them yep. instead of those well, in power. And he too walks away from, uh, even, if we, even if we take out the like walks away from heaven bit, which is also true. Right. Even <laughs> if we just look at Jesus' earthly existence. Carpentry. He too is right. the son of a tradesman. Yes. The yeah. adopted son of a tradesman. And, you know, I, we don't know much about, <laughs> unfortunately, I really think Joseph dies young. Yeah. I re- like, that's that's always it, my read. It, it, it yeah. seems that way. Um, But, like, unfortunately, Joseph disappears in the story because I love him. I would love to know more. I love that we get these, like, little windows of Mary every once in a while, but I wish we got more about Joseph. But, yeah. like, Jesus, too, is the son of a tradesman mm-hmm. who would have been able to have this like secure middle class what is the class in that time but like it's right. kind of middle class life yeah. of like work an honest trade get an honest living have an honest life yeah and he becomes the as the line i keep using because i like the way it sounds the semi homeless traveling rabbi son of a carpenter right like he, <laughs> and he was they, the oldest so he would have been the yeah. one to inherit it all and um mm-hmm. and you don't we don't see the interplay with siblings either but you you, you often wonder of Shouldn't you be here helping mom out? Shouldn't you be you're out gallivanting, yeah. you know? And 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 to me, I, honestly, as I've I've said before, the fact that you do see siblings come to accept him as yep. God and Lord and Savior mm-hmm. is the biggest right plus yeah. of anything. Yeah. Because if anybody's mm-hmm. going to call you out on your BS, it's going to be your brothers and sisters. Oh yeah, right. I one did have to change his name to <laughs> yeah. Jude. Uh, yeah, not not Jude. No, I'm not that dude. No, I'm a uh, I'm not, uh, right. th- Thaddeus, so Labius, uh, the, whatever you want to the, call. Right. For those of, for those of you who don't get the joke, um, Jesus has a brother named Judas, <laughs> who is the purported author of the book of Jude. Jude. 
Uh-huh. And my whole theory on this is, I don't, you know, biblical scholars don't at me. It's just, you know, um, is he had to change his name because uh, he does not want to be called Judas. Yeah, he was awkward. It's just, there's some family trauma about the name Judas. But yeah, you see um, Jude, you see uh, James, the brother of Christ, and you see Mary, all mm-hmm. three involved in the early Christian movement. All three, um, you know, either show up in later biblical, author, you know, Mary and James both get, you know, kind of really talked about a bunch in Acts, yeah. um, as well as in, you know, Mary shows up in a bunch of places in the gospel. And that is, a, that is that real testimony. It does make me wonder who's running the business. As with Peter, so with Jesus, who's running the business? Who is running Joseph's carpentry business? Because it isn't <laughs> Jesus and it isn't James. Maybe it's, Jude. Yeah, Judas. Yeah, you, you've got those Jude. those younger down kids, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, I, I the, the, these are these are the answers you never get from the Bible, but that I always want. I all like cuz maybe it's cuz we all just spend too much time with these guys, but like you spend so Could much be. time you you want you the wonder rest about their backstory. You want the rest of it. You yes. want the like what were these conversations like? And, and maybe I wonder what the conversation was like to the so you're speaking of judas's mm-hmm. judas is in this conversation yes yeah by the way of who's the greatest right like it makes you wonder what did judas say wait did you know judas really thinks the he's the greatest oh mm-hmm. yeah well, because you we get that scene with the the perfume um yes where Ju, where like like peter does uh back a, a couple of scenes ago so Judas does later with the uh, the lady who like takes whatever it is a year's income worth of yeah the alabaster jar type thing yeah mm-hmm. and 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 Judas is like hey we could have sold that and given it to the poor sure Judas sure that's what you're gonna do you were gonna sell it and give it to the poor mm-hmm. yeah buddy poor, sell poor them down the road Judas. for silver okay uh, yeah Judas. all right but like clearly Judas has we don't get it we we, we get shockingly little of Judas's psychology. And that's one of the few windows we get. Like clearly Judas has an inflated sense of self. If mm-hmm. he too is willing to call out Jesus, it's yeah. not every disciple that calls out Jesus that is recorded in scripture for calling out Jesus. True. As being wrong. Yep. Right. <laughs> and, and he and, had that whole Jesus trust me with the money. Right. But, but does he just, I mean, he's letting you but have does it, he, but, but does he? Yeah. Does he? But, but like, yeah. but I think he does. Yeah. I really like, I think that Jesus, under like, I, this is Jesus, and so I suspect he knows exactly what Judas is going to do and gives him the money anyways. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way he you does know? love. That's the way he treats us. Right. An- that, another crazy is, holy mystery. Right. That what? Yeah, this crazy holy mystery that you're, yep. you're going to give him the opportunity to succeed, even if this is, but that's free will. That's yeah. free yep. will. Like Judas had the option to, Judas always, just in the same way that Jesus always had the option to walk away from this. Mm-hmm. Judas always had the option to come through and not do that. Yep. Now, that Jesus knows he's going to do wrong is still different, or else we've robbed free will again. Right. And I never want to do that. Yeah. Is always separate from that you have to do it. It's not determinism. Right. It just God happens to know what you're going to do. Well, and that Jesus knew what Judas was going to do and washed Judas's His feet, feet anyway. Too. Yeah. 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 Yes. He washed also, Judas's feet. That he doesn't... washed Judas's feet. Hmm. Washed Peter's feet, knowing that Peter's going to betray him. Yep. Right? You know, all but John, according to John. All but John. I really, to John. <laughs> really distinct on this. All but John, according to John, let him down that night. Because it's only John standing there at the crucifixion with his mother. Right. According to John. And, 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 and we see the humanness of John, too, because, I yeah. mean, oh, yes. I, I always imagine and joke about that conversation between Peter and John running to the, oh, uh, the yeah, tomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh-huh. I, I can see them out there, and Peter's like... It doesn't matter that you beat me. No one's going to know. Oh, yes, they will. Oh, they'll know. They'll know. Oh, they'll know. I'll yeah, tell let's them. Be clear. I'll John, point it out John twice. John is like, John is like 20, probably as many as 20 years younger than Peter. <laughs> also, we know Peter built for strength, not speed. He's a right? fisherman. Yeah. Right. He's not a rock climber. True. He's a, like, 
you, you, Peter often gets pictured as this like broad, Rugged. very hairy man yes. uh, with a dark, with a gray beard. And yeah. some of that is to the medieval and Renaissance artists trying to communicate his importance, mm-hmm. yeah. like size and grayness were ways to connote you know importance and wisdom. But also, he's like a fisherman pulling in huge nets. Uh-huh. Yes, I can imagine Peter maybe skipped leg day but never missed arm day. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, he is probably, of all of the disciples, he can probably break John over his knee, but no. If he could ever catch it. If he could ever catch it. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah, that would be the, uh, the, the, the issue there. Like, you know, John John may be fast, but, like, if, if Peter ever got him, Peter's just not, as a person, also not built for speed. I just, you know, I identify with Peter in this. Just not built for speed, man. Just not. <laughs> just not built for speed. But it, again, I, I, I don't want to lose sight of this too much. Of We see in Jesus a model of how to live. But Very it's got to be lived intrinsically. Mm-hmm. It's got to, like, you've got to mean it. And that's Really, you know, we've talked about this in the positive a few weeks back. We're like, you can really screw this up, but if your intentions were good, God's going to know it. Mm-hmm. But that then flies the other way too. You can do all the right things. This is the Pharisees, right? Like, you can do all the right things for the wrong reasons, and God's going to know that too. Mm-hmm. And that's not being like Jesus, right? Because you don't just like you do not let yourself get murdered, especially when you have the power to stop it, unless you really mean what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Like He actually lived lived. It is, you know, this is for God so loved the world, right? Like, maybe this is obvious, but I, I, like, that's, that's the stream. That's the part of the stream that I think is important Mm -hmm. that, you know, I, in the sermon, I I took this a little bit about like church life of, you know, we had on, on the how to research a church podcast months now, almost a year ago now, we had Sean and Sean um, and Sean the Younger. Like, we asked him, because he's a Gen Z guy, like, hey, you know, Gen Z, they're not in church. Yo, what's up with that? And, like, or, like, how do we get them back? Like, just a genuine, like, from your perspective as a member of that generation, how do you get them back? And what he came back at with us is, like, hey, what if the church was good, actually? And I'm, like, Gee. actually, just actually be good. Just actually be good. Like, actually do the things you say you mean. Mm. Like, actually live it out. Mm. Actually seem to mean it. And I'm, like, well, shoot. That's not build a building, is it? Darn. It's way mm-hmm. easy. Because like, we, we cook up these things that say this is what's going to bring in the young families or this is what's yeah. going to bring the young people back. If we make it the laser light show, if we build an activities building, if we launch a contemporary service, if we you know sink $5 million into our children's programming and turn it into Six Flags over Jesus. <laughs> not original line. My friend Kathleen wrote that line, and it's just one of the funniest. She worked at a church that was Six Flags yeah. over Jesus. And so uh, she... Uh, we, what if they just do did. what they say they're going to do? What, 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 and actually, like, Sean's purpose was not like, I do not need your church to have a roller coaster. Yeah. Um, roller coasters are cool, I guess. But, like, it was be good. Just yeah. mean it. Right. Like, live, live like you mean it. Like, go, in, go into communities and actually make a difference. Right. Like, if you say this is a religion of grace, be a religion of grace, mm-hmm. not a religion of judgment. Mm-hmm. And, and, like, that is shocking in its simplicity. Shocking yeah. in its, you know, kind of deep yeah. scriptural roots in the life and ministry of Jesus and shocking how convicting it should be for all of us. Yes. That in the end, it is be good. Maybe and, just go do those things that Jesus actually yeah. talked about, the things that Jesus actually demonstrated yeah. for us. Maybe we just go be that. Maybe we just go be that or do Maybe our best just, to try. Right. And, 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 and God, you know, God will see the earnestness of the attempt. Mm-hmm. But it does go back to that, like, that deeper first principles of Jesus doing this all out of love. He does not care that it's going to make him the greatest human that has ever lived. Yeah. It does. It makes him the greatest human that's ever lived. I'm convinced that that's the, I brought this up in the sermon too, of like, I'm convinced that's why Mark keeps, Mark, Mark and Jesus keeps telling people, yo, don't tell anybody. Right. Because he hasn't, my thought is because he hasn't done the thing yet. He's not yet the, he is the son of man. The son of man hasn't really done the thing that the son of man is supposed to do. And so now is not the time to tell people because I haven't earned that respect yet. Yeah. I haven't earned that 
that I am the Son of Man, but I haven't done the thing that the Son of Man is supposed to do. And so don't tell anybody until I've done the thing that I'm supposed to do and really demonstrated that this is how much I love you. Hmm. Um, anyways, that's as good a place as many is for us to, to bring this in for a landing. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. If you have your own stories about truly great people, yeah. not people who really want to be great, but truly great people, mm. I would love to hear about them. Those are the kind of stories I just love. Um, mm. The goodness of God pod at gmail.com. That is the goodness of God pod at gmail.com. We have a lot that uh, a lot that we make and a lot uh, that we are going to be launching in the next week. This is launch week uh, for uh, some really cool brand dun, new stuff. Dun, dun. Um, and so follow us in service now on all the things right now. And you will hear um, about, uh, about, and I guess I'll tease just the name, just the, just the name, just the name, uh, tease the divine provisions co, um, which is the kind of next generation of our digital ministry. And so uh, uh, to hear more about the Divine Provisions Co., uh, uh, for right now, uh, follow us in Servants Now. And then uh, there will be some other places for uh, you to follow us uh, starting next week. Uh, but it's Servants Now on TikTok, on Instagram, Facebook.com slash Servants Now, uh, Insta- uh, YouTube.com slash Servants Now, and ServantsNow.org on the interwebs. This and everything else we do um, here in the Media Lab is made possible by a generous innovators grant by the Texas Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. If you want to support us, we could use your help. Like, comment, subscribe, share, leave five-star reviews in Apple Podcast. All that helps this show go further and helps this become more sustainable. And go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We'll see you next time. <laughs>